Test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome everybody. Coffee with Kalepi, August already. Can you believe that? How the time flies. Hey, I'm proud and excited to introduce uh, Danny Gao, Energy Solutions Incorporated. He works out of the Triad area of the North Carolina. Um, I've known him for years. Uh, we had a chance to get together, what was in Vegas last year, I think, or two years ago maybe, Danny. We chewed the fat a little bit. That was fun. Um, I think if you were to look up the word overachiever somewhere, you would see a picture of Danny because he's certainly done it all. He's a BPI certified building and analyst, been a, what, a licensed contractor, mechanical contractor in North Carolina for over 30 years, instructor with the uh, NAH, NAHB, National Association of Home Builders, um, writes articles, and newspapers, a couple books, Solar Fundamentals and Build It Right. Um, He's a great guy. He's a funny guy. He's fun, and he's put together a really interesting presentation. I had the, the chance to sneak preview it a little bit. Yes, I think you're going to really like this one. So I know you've got a lot to cover. Thanks, Danny, for being here. What do you want to tell us about yourself? Oh, nothing. Really, it's nothing relevant. Let's just get moving. We've got a lot of stuff to cover here, and um, <clears throat> value. everybody's time is valuable, so let's just be good stewards and get rolling. And um, I want to welcome everybody as well, and uh, thanks, Bob, for asking me. And as, as I said, we've got a lot of stuff to cover, so uh, let's move right on. Topic today is geothermal, and we want to talk about the words are important. If you call a girl a kitten, you uh, may earn some points. If you call her a cat, you've got a problem. So geothermal is actually comes from two Greek words, geo meaning earth and thermi meaning having something to do with heat. The idea of sticking them together occurred somewhere around 1870, and together the words mean something pertaining to the internal heat of the earth. Now, of late, the word is associated with these devices, uh, these boxes. We call these geothermal heat pumps. Interesting, though, it, it hasn't always been that way because prior to the 80s, this same box uh, was installed and called a water-to-air heat pump or a similar box, similar technology. Uh, they usually required a water source, always required a water source, typically a water well, sometimes a really good spring, on the commercial sector. In the commercial sector, they were typically cooling towers or boilers. Now, a few people know this, but this peanut farmer from Georgia uh, should be considered the real father of the modern era geothermal heat pump. That's because uh, he signed the 1978 Energy Policy Act in 78 in response to the uh, oil embargo of 73. What the act did was is it gave Americans uh, tax incentives to improve the efficiency of their home and you see the list there, insulation, storm windows, caulking, ceiling, furnace replacements, those kinds of things. As also, as part of that, there were three renewable sources that could earn uh, tax incentives, and those were solar, geothermal, and wind. And uh, not many people knew much about what geothermal was, but it quickly spread that if you put one in, you could get 40% of your money back. And interestingly, in North Carolina, we had an additional credit of 25%. So 65% was what North Carolinians were looking at. So prior to the 80s, these devices were called water-to-air heat pumps. But after the 78 Energy Policy Act, uh, an amazing thing happened. We, I, I think it was maybe somewhat akin to an ambush in that the water source heat pumps started disappearing from the distributor shelves and they were replaced by the new and improved uh, geothermal heat pump. And so everybody, uh, a simple name change and some creative tax planning, everybody earned a 40% tax credit. Supposedly supposed to live happily ever after, but in 1982, the General Accounting Office expressed some concern that there were some people taking this tax credit who may not have been entitled to take it. And for good reason, because the IRS had determined in their definition that this geothermal renewable energy source, your, your source in the, in the yard had to provide about 122 degree fluid. I've seen that happen in uh, closed cell geothermal units, but it was purely by an accident or poor design. So that, there was a definition here, 122 degrees to take the credit. And in the 82, even on the tax forms, the 5695 form where you took the credit, it specifically stated heat pumps were not eligible, both air and water. But that didn't deter most folks because they weren't putting in water-to-air heat pumps. They were putting in the new geothermal heat pump. In 83, the uh, IRS went so far as to actually put the temperature requirements on the tax form. And so, uh, again, not many people were deterred. And we've had several iterations of these Energy Policy Acts since then. The first one in 78 referred to geothermal as hot rocks, synonymous with hot rocks. 
And 92, we saw mention of uh, two different kinds, the geothermal heat pump and the hot rocks. And I think around 2005, the evolution was complete to where the name geothermal heat pump pretty much seized the technology. Now, along the same time, uh, actually prior to the 78 Energy Policy Act, Dr. James Bowes, Oklahoma State University, was experimenting with water and air heat pumps and coupling them to pipes in the ground. And he, uh, his, his research used in a 50s, a 1950 engineering textbook, led him to install a system in a home in Oklahoma in 75 that I believe is still working today. And so as a result of, of uh, his research, the state of Oklahoma and particularly Stillwater and OSU have become sort of the Silicon Valley of this type technology. It really wasn't new because according to Ripley, it's this fellow named Weber in Indianapolis who did this in 47 in this seven-room home. He pulled heat out of the earth to heat his house. And uh, eventually the Oklahoma State uh, research, Dr. Bose and other pioneers, uh, spawned the creation of the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association. It's the industry bar association. They do a lot of great work in setting standards and engineering uh, methodology. And notice uh, it is not the, the International Geothermal Heat Pump Association but they have become the premier support association. Now, it's just an introduction to you. We've played a little name game with you here. We have the ground source heat pump, the geothermal water source, and the ground couples. You say potato, I say potato. I think largely a lot of this name changing was simply because the geothermal just sounds more green. And, of course, you know that's a big agenda in our society today. There are primarily two different species of these devices we're going to talk about. And, of course, there's a, uh, a hybrid. We have the water-to-air, the forced-air version, and we have the water-to-water. -water. And then they got together and actually created a little one called uh, the combination unit, which is a, 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 a combination of the two functions, forced-air and a little bit of water-to-water -water as well. Of course, with the forced air system, it's really no different than a conventional heat pump or conventional gas furnace and AC. You'll need a distribution system to deliver the air to the conditioned space. This is the way these things work. You take the fluid, the uh, liquid refrigerant that comes out of the expansion valve here, it goes into a, a, a coax, which is coupled to your ground loop. So the refrigerant goes through here as a liquid, and at the same time, the ground loop fluid is going through the secondary side of the coax comes out the other side in the heating mode, and it's harvested BTUs from that fluid that's actually buried in the ground. Then the refrigerant turns to a vapor, comes over to the compressor as the vapor comes back out. The compressor, as a hot gas at higher pressure, moves through the reversing valve and back to a condenser coil, which then in turn uh, puts the heat into the air through the uh, blower and the, the uh, cabinet of the unit and then goes back through the cycle again. It's no different than any other refrigeration cycle. And in the cooling season, all we do is reverse the cycle simply by, whoops, back up, simply by uh, putting the liquid into the evaporator coil, same coil, just change function, and it just reverses itself. We take the heat out of the house, put it through the compressor, and then dump it in the coax, eventually into the ground. Very simple, same operation as uh, conventional heating systems. The other species is the water-to-water -water or hydronic, and these come in primarily two varieties. You have the medium temp, or some people refer to that maybe as a low temp machine that will go up to 120, and then you have uh, some units that will actually make up to 150 degree water. And a lot of these units are reversible, meaning that they'll make hot water and chill water through one box. And so on the water-to-water -water side, you can use medium temp, and your emitters can be, of course, uh, radiant floor heating. And we have another source, assortment of uh, emitters here, types of radiators, towel warmers, uh, low-temp baseboards, uh, the wall-hung unit by Myasin and others. And the circulating hot water baseboards we've routinely seen in homes, it's a bit iffy. It depends on uh, how much oversizing you have in the design temps originally. Uh, it may work. You just have to do your uh, your homework there. On the cooling side, you've got uh, a few options here. Of course, we hear a lot now about uh, radiant cooling, so that's an option with the chill water side of water to water. Of course, the wall hung, and then the uh, 
the uh, air handler, the forced air fan coil. These fan coils come with uh, one coil for double duty. You can use one coil for chill water in the summer and heating in the uh, wintertime, or you can get what's called the four-pipe air handler, which ha actually have two independent coils. One is used for chill water. The other is used for heating. Uh, the advantage to the four-pipe is in my neck of the woods we have humidity issues, so you can use the two, the four-pipe air handler, the two independent coils for cooling and uh, dedicated dehumidification. Of course, the uh, refrigerant cycle looks identical to the, uh, the forced air side. The only thing we've done is we've pulled the, uh, the air coil out of the picture and we've just inserted a second coax called a load coax. And the refrigerant in the uh, wintertime uh, goes into the coax, the earth, the earth loop coax is a liquid. It starts boiling as it puts heat into the refrigerant from the, uh, the ground coil through the reversing valve into the compressor compressor and increases the pressure, puts the hot gas in the primary or the secondary side, one or the other of the coax, and then the uh, coax is connected typically to a buffer tank uh, to make uh, hot water for whatever their needs are. Exact same thing happens in the cooling. We may do a sl slide over with the reversing valve. We just reverse the refrigerant flow. Now we're putting uh, heat in the ground and uh, making chill water into the uh, buffer tank. Same technology. I threw this up just to get, make you familiar with it. This, this is the hybrid unit. It's a triple function unit. There's just a few manufacturers that make this. It's great for applications where you have just a modicum amount of radiant or you just need a, a small amount of radiant floor or, or whatever application. This is sort of nice to be able to do this all out of one box and there is some uh, money savings to do it. And the way they do it is you just put in a little parallel uh, circuit of either a load coax or if you have a water-to-water -water unit, you want to look at that. It's just the uh, parallel air coil and the fan. And uh, you choose the priority which you want to operate, if you want radiant floor to operate, or the uh, forced air side to operate. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of anybody that makes a triple function machine that actually makes chill water, although uh, I, I'd be the first to admit there probably may be one. I'm just not aware of it. Now there's another device that is uh, frequently associated with uh, water to air or geothermal heat pumps and that's called the desuperheater. Some manufacturers call it a hot water generator. This device has been around a long time and there's no reason it couldn't be used on air source, air conditioners or heat pumps. It's simply another coax that just fits into the discharge line coming off the compressor. It pulls the hot gas off the compressor, sends it through the primary side of the coax while at the same time we're pulling cooler air from the water heater through the secondary side and as the hot gas and the refrigerant pass through the coax, the heat is exchanged from the hot refrigerant into the water heater or preheat tank. And uh, in, the one, in the summertime, we have uh, customers that tell us they can turn the breaker off to their electric water heater. And oh, all in all, in the winter, it actually takes BTUs from the heating side, and, uh, but it's still overall probably I would guess 40 to 60 percent savings by employing this device. It's pretty smart because if you think about it, you're paying a power company to run a compressor and in this case uh, at least one indoor fan, a couple circulators. You turn right around and pay them again to uh, buy more electricity to put into your water for domestic use. And since essentially what we're doing here is taking the heat in the summer, taking the heat out of the house and just dumping it in the water heater. Now on the rating side, efficiency, uh, how do we determine the efficiency numbers on these things? We use the ISO uh, standard 13256-1, and I think the uh, AHRI and ASHRAE converted to this standard 98. And what you'll see, this is a chart from one of the equipment manufacturers that show three different rating points. And what differentiates these rating points is the entering water temperature, temperature designated on the chart here by EWT. And these three categories are water loop heat pumps, which usually refers to boiling boilers and cooling towers, the ground water heat pump, uh, typically that's a well water system, and then the last column would refer to uh, the ground loops, geothermal systems. Uh, there are different uh, rating points for heating and cooling, and I'll, I'll mention that this is actually a two-stage unit, so you have uh, two ratings for each size, a full load, and then the compressor has unloaders that runs about 70% of full load. So you'll see metrics on each one in two different categories. Now the metric you use for the cooling or the heating performance is the coefficient performance, no different than the air-to-air -air side. Simply means the BTUs that the unit delivers divided by 
the uh, energy it takes to produce those BTUs converted right into BTUs again. So if you have a unit that has a COP of 3.16, it simply means that every dollar you pay the power company, you theoretically get $3.16 a heat delivered out of the unit. And you see, if we go back to our chart, the rule here is the warmer the water, the higher the COP is going to be. So if you look across the top, the cooling tower, boiler uh, application points are going to yield the highest COPs of any, looks like 4.8 to uh, over 6, 6.4. And then you can go across and see the ground loops are the lowest because the entering water temp is going to be cooler. Less be to use in cooler water. On the cooling side, we use the energy efficiency ratio, or the EERs, not the SER, which is a seasonal efficiency. EER is sort of a grab sample. And we compute that by the BTUs divided by the actual KWH used by the box to, do, to remove those BTUs. So if you have an EER 15.5, it simply means for every watch you pay for, you get 15 and a half BTUs removed. Once again, if you look at the chart, the rule here is going to be the cooler the entering water temperature, the higher the EER is going to be. And in this case, the higher EERs are going to show up on the groundwater heat pump ratings. So you see that water is 59 degrees, and you have EERs uh, off the, or EER off the chart here of, like, there's 135. So that's the EER. People say, well, where do you find these ratings? Uh, the first place you may want to look is the uh, detailed uh, specifications from the manufacturer you're considering. Or here's a website, ahrinet.org, that has them all on it. You simply go there, select the category you want to search, put in your capacities, any other filters, and it just throws them all up on the screen. You can sort them. So everybody's there that has an AHRI certification. Here's a few reminders about ratings. We get hung up on uh, bragging about SERs in the air-to-air -air world. Uh, but these ratings are simply for comparing units, and sometimes we forget that. On the 132.56-1 standard, be reminded that it does not include pump power, and pump power can, power can make a huge difference in the real-world ratings in the, uh, on the project. Another thing that's not necessarily a tip, but it's something that's good to know, is not all geothermal ground source units qualify for the federal tax credits. So you need to check. It's a lot easier to verify before you get uh, uh, frustrated with the homework calling and saying, hey, the tax credit you promised, uh, my accountant says it doesn't, doesn't fly. And you can find uh, those, those tax qualified purchase or uh, units on the uh, AHR site as well. Here's another website you may want to bookmark. This is a, uh, shows all the federal incentives as well as the states that offer state incentives on uh, ground source heat pumps, even the power company rebates, uh, low interest loans. It's about anything that you need to know about incentives for the customer. You'll find it at this website. And uh, I think this is run by on the campus of North Carolina State. Another reminder is, is, we tend to forget this, is that ratings are, they really have very little relevance to the real world. Typically these, these units are rated in a pristinely clean uh, laboratory with uh, somebody that's tweaked on the unit and wearing a lab coat under an unrealistic set of conditions. And when you, when you purchase these units and you get it to the job site and uncrate it, you find that the guy in the lab coat didn't come in the box. So it's your responsibility as an installing contractor or designer uh, to make sure that the efficiency you represent is actually delivered to your consumer. So what's the best? Is it the forced air system? Is it the water-to-water -water system? Or is it the combination system? In my opinion, the best system is the one that's professionally designed, properly installed, and appropriately commissioned. This is sort of my mantra of even the air-to-air -air systems. On the air to air side, the path that I take typically is, um, well, most always, is the air, ACA professional design process where we uh, are zealous about manual J room by room loads. We use manual S, manual D for the distribution system, manual T for air distribution. And the latest uh, in the series is manual ZR, which addresses zoning. And then ACA also has a series of publications called QI standards that walk you through uh, the actual QC of the installation. The great thing is we're, we're blessed to have great software to make this job easier. 
This is my favorite Elite Software. Uh, Bill Smith uh, runs the place there. I don't do the drawing modules that some of you may be familiar with. I just anything other than a small house, I don't think it generates accurate loads. I can't draw them anyway. And then Elite also has a really nice plug-in for the manual decalculations where we can follow the airflow through the system and, pr and uh, project the uh, friction loss as a fitting library in here and everything. And you see this, you know that something fell through the cracks. I don't think uh, ACA was in the vocabulary here. And the same procedure is uh, comparable also to the hydronic side, whether you're talking about radiant floor or uh, cooling. Followed in all the way into the equipment room, your controls, your circulators. We need to follow the same methodology. And here we've got uh, some great support uh, material from uh, Kalefi, the hydronic series is just chock full. Number nine is the one that addresses the geothermal topic and it's just uh, extremely well written, put together and, and it's amazing to me that it's free. You can download it uh, and uh, just good good stuff there. Of course we have uh, you know the giants of the industry, Siggy stuff and then Dan stuff and I don't want to forget my Canadian friend uh, Robert Bean whose uh, website is voluminous. I don't know how Robert does anything other than write the website stuff. And of course, we have uh, good software on the uh, on the fluid flow side as well. Uh, Taco was the one, uh, Luke Cad, and then John Siegenthaler's uh, design suite as well. And instructions are important. This is a really important tip. A lot of HVAC contractors think that uh, instructions actually mean suggestions, and uh, there's a lot of good stuff in instructions. And even with this is from Water Furnace, it even tells you how to start the unit up, has a checklist, a lot of good stuff. If you don't follow instructions, bad things can happen. This guy wanted to put this thermal blanket on his water heater and uh, it didn't turn out exactly like probably it was intended to, to turn out. Now, you'll find that uh, the majority of the problems with performance of these type heat pumps is going to be on the water side, the loop side. So we're going to take uh, just a few minutes and re review some of the uh, essentials here. And the discussion is going to be divided into uh, two types of loops, the open loop and the closed loop, primarily the closed loop. Open loop essentially means uh, typically it's a water well, and uh, you push the water through the machine at the uh, flow rate that's required by the manufacturer to do the job, and then you have to dispose of the water some way. These were the first air-to-water, water-to-air heat pumps that uh, we actually were involved in were this type configuration. Now, here are some challenges. One is you have to have sufficient quantity. Uh, these units are used anywhere from uh, two to three gallons per minute. And so you've got to have a well with that much yield. Otherwise, you've got a no heat or no cooling complaint. The second thing that you need to consider is not just the quantity of the water, but also what's the water quality. There's a lot of stuff in water that doesn't like uh, ground source heat pumps. So it's my recommendation, if you go to those instructions, there typically is a guide there, have the water tested, pH, sediment, iron bacteria, those kinds of things to make sure before you dive into uh, the open well system, make sure that your water's in good shape. The third challenge is uh, the pump size. And as we mentioned, the ISO numbers don't include the pump penalties. And the well driller that is not IGSPA certified and is typically unknowing, uh, they will sabotage this every time. If the well is 400 foot deep, they immediately think we need a 17 horsepower pump to push the water up to the top of the ground when the water may be 11 feet from the top of the ground. And so you have to really be careful and rein in the well driller that's really zealous about putting in a, a more robust pump than the application really needs. And then the fourth thing we found to be a challenge is disposal. We're an environmentally sensitive society now, and you just can't run water out on your yard. There's a lot of rules and regulations. Sometimes uh, it may be appropriate to return some of the water back into the same well, depending on your loads and your conditions. That requires permits and environmental concerns. So just be sure that you know the rules and regulations about disposal. I think that's about all we're going to say about open loops. The majority of the market's dealing with the closed loops. And we're talking here about three different configurations, the vertical loop and the horizontal. And then we're going to talk briefly about pond loops. 
vertical loop is simply as it's stated. It's just a post hole that you dig vertically in the ground, a well driller typically. And these, these holes are six to eight inch diameter. They can be anywhere from 200 to 400 feet deep or maybe even deep, deeper. And they typically include uh, a one circuit, one pair returning the supply. This is the way it works. It just goes down into the uh, hole, makes a U-turn, comes right back to the top. There's a series of uh, multiple wells on larger jobs. Sometimes smaller systems you can get by with one. Here's what the U-bend looks like on the bottom. This comes factory fusioned onto the pipe, so you don't have to do this yourself. A word about the pipe here we're using uh, may be appropriate. This is uh, uh, poly, uh, polyethylene SDR11 is the uh, the grade. It's, it's the same pipe they use to understand for natural gas going down the street. It, most manufacturers offer a 50-year no-leak warranty for this pipe. Uh, this accelerated testing, I've been told, says that it will last 200 years, but after that, you're on your own. And that's what the UBN looks like that you're going to stick down in the post hole. A couple tips about uh, vertical loops is it's extremely important. You just hang this loop down into a post hole like this, and there's nothing but air separating it from the walls. You won't get much heat transfer. And so you need to put something in this angular space. Most of the jobs we're doing, we use an enhanced grout, uh, the base material being uh, bentonite. And uh, it's filled from the bottom up to where we have good conductivity from these uh, pipes going down into the well and uh, the surrounding earth. And here's the best advice I can give you if you're a contractor wanting to delve into this is find a well driller. Partner with a well driller that's IGSMA certified and also knows what he's doing. He will save you a lot of headaches, a lot of liability, uh, frustration, and uh, make you look really good and possibly get you a lot more work. This is the people I use here locally. Uh, really good sharp guys, Yadkin Well. Now let's move on to the horizontal loops. The horizontal loops, uh, the tools of the trade are a track hoe or a back hoe. Track hoe is just a little faster. And then on the other side, we have a trencher that can go five to six foot deep. On the horizontal loop side, there's just as many horizontal loop configurations almost as there are Baskin Robbins flavors. And here's a couple of the more popular. There's the one pipe trench where you just trench and put one pipe down in the bottom, make a U-turn with your trencher and come back. Uh, then there's the two pipe trench, and you can do two pipe trenches either with the backhoe. You see the picture there is a two foot bucket. Or you can do it with a trencher and double back in the same hole. This is the one we use most uh, that we specify as the four pipe trench. It shows a two foot bucket. We typically do three foot for better heat transfer. You put uh, one set of pipes in the bottom on opposite ends of the trench, and then you come back off of the bottom two feet and set the other circuit there, or vice versa. You can have one circuit top, one circuit bottom, or you can have side to side circuits but that does require the backhoe. And then there's the six pipe trench, which is uh, really ambitious. This is, uh, some people do this and, and have it down to an art. I've never, uh, never been able to figure out how to do it efficiently, but uh, you can actually put uh, three circuits in a two foot trench or three foot trench. These loops, by the way, are determined by the load and the number of other parameters we'll talk about. They're typically 250 to 400 foot trenches and you go there and come back, so your pipe lengths are going to be anywhere from 500 to 800 feet. Then there's a group that likes the slinky loops, and the slinky loops, simply what it means, it's a sort of a spiral kind of arrangement that uh, you take the pipe out and then create with uh, certain pitches. All this stuff would be in the eggs for training and the, um, the design manuals. And there are two types of slinky. There's the one that requires the backhoe. This is a three-foot trench, and you lay it flat in the, in the bottom of the trench. Then you can use the trencher into a vertical slinky. You use, typically, these are used uh, where you have a uh, minimal amount of real estate uh, because these trenches, you can get a, a lot of pipe in a 100 to 150-foot trench. If you have, like, a small lot and you have restrictions on how much you can uh, how far you can dig, then this may be the appropriate design. And here's what it looks like uh, once, you, uh, once you install it. One of the other advantages of slinkies is, is that if you have uh, OSHA presence or other people that uh, are concerned about uh, KVM rules and regulations, which is a, a viable concern, uh, five foot, I believe, is the, the limit I've heard that you don't need KVM protection. So 
slinkies do work fairly well at the five foot level in my neck of the woods. Now you need to check your particular locale, of course. But that's what the horizontal slinky looks like in the bottom of the trench. Here we've excavated uh, a huge, uh, almost like a basement, and you can do them like this as well. Lay uh, multiples and then backfill the entire, the entire loop fill. And this is how the uh, vertical slinky goes in. You simply trench and throw it down in vertically. A word of caution on the using the trencher for any type of ground source uh, loop is you have to be really studious about your backfill. The, depending on the dirt, uh, it tends to bridge across the, uh, the trench. So you need to be sure that you get it uh, completely backfill. Uh, sometimes you have to use water. But uh, if you don't have the backfill, you won't have the heat transfer. The last configuration is the pond loop. If you have a pond or a body of water that's sufficient depth and area to handle the load, these are loops that will work well in those situations. This is the coil loop is simply you take a bundle of pipe and you insert spacers in between each one of the, the coils to get uh, good circulation between them. And then you build some type of, of rack. We usually use like a ladder type arrangement out of PVC. And, um, you float it out into the body of water and fill it with the fluid and it sinks to the bottom. And the other option is the pond mat, which is almost akin to the slinky that you uh, put together and float it out and do it the same way. And here's uh, the mat system that's floated and just about ready to go under. If you ever need to service these things, you simply just pull the fluid out and they float back to the top. This is a, a, a product that's been around a good while. It's called a Slim Jim Lake Plate. And I, I have to confess, I've never used one, but they've been around long enough to where you could reasonably be assured that they probably do work if they're appropriately applied. It's, I believe, a titanium plate. It looks sort of like an absorber in a, a solar collector. And uh, it would connect the same way you notice you have a header there that uh, you connect to your uh, piping to and from the mechanical room. Float it out and fill it, and I'm assuming it sinks to the bottom just like the others. One tip that I would uh, bring to mind, we've had uh, one lake loop that actually got pierced by a frog gig, and if the people can get to it, it seems like that they will. Uh, I've had uh, people say that they put chain link fence on the top of the uh, their loops to protect them from boat anchors. So whatever makes common sense for you to do, if you know the traffic in your body of water, whatever, that may be appropriate. So what do you think is the best ground loop? We hear people argue about this all the time. Which is better, vertical? Vertical is better, horizontal better. If you got a pond, and um, the same answer to the, uh, the previous question is the best loop is the one that's professionally designed, properly installed, and appropriately commissioned. Now, of course, there are cost barriers and there are real estate barriers, but in every case, this is the right answer. So what are some considerations in that view if you know that's your target? Number one is we can't stress enough that you need to do accurate heat loss and heat gain calculations. They're an absolute must. Room by room, manual day, eighth edition, very aggressive. And uh, if you start off with the wrong foundation, it just goes downhill from there. Sort of like balancing your checkbook. You know, if you let one mistake, it just leads to just a horrific a lot of pain at the end. So make sure you get a good accurate heat loss and heat gain. And then the other thing to be reminded of is that the loop temperatures determine your, your equipment capacity. And what I mean by that is if you look at the extended cooling capacities, and we design these systems in my neck of the woods for cooling, and there are parts of the country that may not be the case, but uh, the loop temperature, the end water temperature, actually determines the size of the equipment that you would specify. So if you want to design a loop that uh, the system will have a maximum in the summer of 95 degrees, then that unit's not going to produce the BTUs of one that has a loop design of 84 degrees. So you have to watch those kinds of things in the, the professional design process. And of course, we mentioned before, you have to consider the area that you have available for the loop fill. Sometimes real estate's in premium and you may not have any choice but the vertical option. And then IGSBA training will teach you this, that the soil classification is extremely important. You need to know the type of soil in your geographic location and its uh, conductivity attributes. There are some soils that require less loop than other soils.
samples. So you need to be a little bit of a geologist to do this correctly. And this is just my opinion. I'm not sure that the industry would agree, but um, I always try to stay away from chemicals anytime I can in that loop. Uh, if we can use water, it just makes everybody's life so much simpler. And then, as always, know your local coding restrictions because they'll come back and bite you in the, the end and you need to be proactive and know what's required up front. So the steps are, number one, is you need to get trained and no better place to go than the ICSPA certification curriculum. You can do this online. There's manufacturers that offer this training, and it is just a kick-butt series of engineering classes that take you every step of the way to, to design these systems properly. Once you get trained, the good news is that we also have uh, some really good software. Most of the major manufacturers have proprietary software that follow the IGSBA methodology. Of course, you can buy it. I think Elite uh, has an option for that, and WriteSoft. A lot of people use WriteSoft as well. And, and there may be other options uh, as well. I've just put the ones that we deal with on the screen here. The most important thing is, is to know the methodology first before you uh, navigate the software. Simply knowing the software and how to navigate through the screens does not make you uh, competent at the design. Here are some of the screenshots from either Water Furnace or Climate Master software. I think this is Water Furnace. The inputs required, of course, is your heat loss and heat gain, your sensible heat ratios, um, your design temps. You can manipulate the internal gains by a little calculator here, and um, your hot water needs, how many people living in the house, to set points of the thermostat. Then you configure your loop. You tell the software, this is what I think I want to try. And the great thing about software is you can run all these what ifs, whether it's a, a horizontal, vertical, or a lake loop, you can just you can do what ifs until your heart's content. So you put all your inputs in here, and then you generate the outputs. I just put a snippet. There's more information on these outputs than you probably will ever need on the on the job. But this one shows it's the vertical loop run shows that the average depth is 150 feet, and that means the hole is 300 feet. And we need 1,200 feet of that. So uh, you need to do the math and figure out how many holes of what depth that is. The more important numbers for your system selection is what's going to be the maximum that the loop temperature is going to see in the summer and the minimum extreme in the winter. Then you have to go back and double check your equipment selections to make sure you still look good there. A lot of cases you can manipulate the loop and actually drop the capacity of the equipment uh, half a ton or so. Now this this is the uh, moving into some best practice tips. This is sort of the industry standard for consolidating these different circuits. This is called a header. These come fabricated, prefabricated, or you can build your own. There, the heat fusion process melts the fitting uh, to the uh, header itself, and you just consolidate all these circuits into a pit, uh, pressure test it, and then you just bury all this conglomeration of piping uh, underground. I've always been troubled by that thought, especially at night when I'm trying to sleep. And my concern's always been, well, how do I know that we have equal flow through each circuit? You do want to do reverse return. How do I know there's not uh, air bubbles in some of the circuits? So I've always preferred to bring all the circuits into the mechanical room. In, in this case, you see a header that was actually built. You can build these yourself, and you see you have uh, ball valves on each one of the circuits. So I think, in my opinion, this is just a, a little better best practice. Now this is my product that I just fell in love with. This is the Kalefi Geocal Manifold. It follows my uh, theory that we need to bring in the circuits to the mechanical room. And you'll see in the photo right here, see if I can point this. This is what I'm talking about. And it comes in, these are actually four vertical bore holes, comes into the foundation here. And then there's a, a two headers here, a pair of headers. The fluid's coming into the, the lower one and going out the bottom one, going over to, this is a water-to-water -water unit, going over to and then returning back to the bottom header, or the top header. <clears throat> and the reason I like these is, first of all, we've got our circuits inside. Let's look at a closer picture here. Is um, you've got a ball valve on each one of these circuits. This is a Kalefi 132 quick setter flow meter, which we'll talk about in just a minute. You can isolate each loop. They have pressure, temperature displays. It has air elimination. 
uh, it, you can purge by cutting off all but one. It makes getting the air out of the system a lot easier. Just a lot of good things to say about this product. Another thing you'll find that when you start into the designing of these loops that it's a balancing act. You need to run the what ifs on pressure, pressure uh, drop through the loop, the friction loss, and compare it to the actual pump selection. And then teetering on the top of the process is always you have to realize uh, turbulent flow for the maximum heat transfer of the piping to the adjoining soil represented by the Reynolds number. And I should put a dollar sign up there because sometimes you can do cost trade-offs and actually reduce the overall cost of the loop by manipulating some of these factors. But it's truly a balancing act that you can, uh, you can play with. And the software makes this great uh, to be able to do this. And another thing about uh, the balancing act that I would mention is the manufacturers uh, cater the HVAC industry love this uh, plug and play type capability so the manufacturers actually offer pump centers as this one's displayed here and it is sort of a plug and play option and it's much easier you have three way valves that make the purging of the loop uh, simpler but we found that that option limits the uh, selection of your circulators and here's a comparison between the new Grunfos uh, ECM versus the uh, standard uh, industry pump center with standard circulators now the industry is coming around and there are some ECM options I'm seeing come to the market. Here's another great product that uh, again balancing that loop flow is uh, these lower friction loss elbows. This is made by my, my buddy Jim Manning at, John Manning at uh, Phoenix Flow Centers just uh, simply seeking for less pressure drop. And then somebody asked the question what about air and dirt. Uh, it's the same rules apply in the hydronics and solar and, and ground source. They're your enemy. There's a couple products that will help in that regard is the, uh, the dirt cow uh, dirt separator and then the air eliminator, both uh, great Kalefi products that can be put in the loop. Uh, and then the device to the left is a purge cart. And this is the way we actually fill the uh, loop with uh, the, the heat transfer fluid. It connects to purge ports and we have an onboard pump there. The, the key is two, two feet per second to get all the air out. But I'm telling you, it really would, you do yourself a favor if you have air elimination built in because five out of ten times, six out of ten times, you don't get all the air out. You have another trip back to the homeowner's house. People that pay the money for these premium systems are not as forgiving for those callbacks. So we always try our best to put in the uh, automatic air elimination as well as the purging, proper purging. Uh, be sure that you don't uh, have a situation where you're letting water in the homeowner's basement. Again, the premium systems require premium features. This is another product. I don't think that Kalefi makes this, but they do offer it. It's a geo-seal uh, coupling that goes around. It fits between the, the sleeve going through the wall and your pipe, and you, you tighten the hex heads, and it swells up and makes an airtight seal. Of course, being an, an anal person as I am, we are bulletproof. We have belts and suspenders, and I go outside, and we do this as well. I want to make sure. There's no chance of any water leaking into that house. And here's a good idea. Is eventually, when you put a ground source heat pumps in, there will be one day that the homeowner will call and say, we're thinking about installing a swimming pool, and you need to come and tell us where that pipe is you put in the ground. Always good to have a map of where that stuff is. And uh, I would recommend that you make at least three copies of this. It don't have to be fancy. It's triangulation on two vertical wells that uh, David Brown, my well driller, did. And you put one with the equipment, you keep one in your files, and then you have the homeowner attach one to the deed. Uh, here's a couple uh, neat products in, in regard to finding trenches and wells. Detectable tape, this is again Peterson Company, um, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, you can buy this. Uh, it has metal uh, impregnated in the tape and you can use uh, this and bury it with your earth loops. Use a metal detector to find out where the missing pipe is. And then you also have uh, a disc that you can use to plant top of the vertical loop. Those, I didn't mention this before, but these vertical loops are completely covered under grass or pavement, whatever your option would be. And so you can use this disc to actually locate it later on. And then there's a really good uh, 
And this is the Kalefi 132 quick setter. You pull the hand grenade pin and determine the flow rate simply by watching the indicator. So either method's fine. Then we want to know the temperature difference. What's uh, heating and cooling? What's the temperature difference across this coax? The same thing applies. We can use the Pete's plugs and stick a pocket thermometer in there. There's a couple other fancier ones. This is what the Pete's plug looks like. This is the receiving end, and you can take this probe and attach it to the gauge of your choice. Here's one you can buy that already has it put together. And then the, here's an insert that you can use a thermocouple on, like a Fluke 52. Or any, it's a 10K. Makes it a little, a little neater. You do the math, delta T times GPM times 500. I hope a lot of people have uh, recognized that. You simply uh, compare that to the number the manufacturer says you should be seeing. Of course, uh, adjusting for flow rate and water temps. It's really simple. Probably takes all the 15 minutes. No need for refrigerant gauges. Here's another best tip. If you use antifreeze, be sure to test it. This is a hydrometer, and you just you purchase this, take a sample, float it, look across, and then it'll read the uh, the specific gravity. Use the chart of whatever mixture you're using, and it'll tell you how how low the temperature will go before that fluid will freeze. Here's another great product. People will say, well, what do you do if you get a, le a leak in the loop? This is Fix-A-Flat for geothermal systems, geothermal. I've never had this not work. Now, so knock on wood, I probably will now that I've said that, but uh, you, and you just put this in the fluid and it magically seals the leak. Now, I don't mean somebody cut it with a uh, trencher. This is a small uh, fusion type leaks that were done, fittings done improperly. And then we need to provide measurable results. There's a big difference between uh, predicting savings, energy savings, and providing energy savings. And I've, our company, we've done uh, heating and cooling guarantees for over 20 years. As so we actually guarantee the heating and cooling costs not to exceed our prediction, or we pay the homeowner the difference. So what can you expect? Well, if you if you do it uh, improperly, you might expect something like this. It's a 2,300 square foot home. The homeowners were told that they would save 40 to 50 percent on their energy bills, and their bill actually went up $800. So what went wrong? They had a, le a leak in the loop. Uh, the units were twice the size. They had two units in the house. The units were twice the size they needed to be. Uh, they had put a uh, makeup water connection to the let, to the loop and actually took the makeup water off the hot water port of the water heater. So I guess that improves the COP, but it didn't do much for the energy bill. Here's another example. This is probably my favorite. This is an Energy Star rated home, 6,000 square feet or so. And last July, the, the bill was actually close to $900. The, ground, the contractor, the, the ground loop was about a third of the size it needed to be, thankfully, for the contractor. The homeowner had a, uh, some undeveloped property adjoining. They were able to go and add to the loop, and we took a, what's called a directional bore machine and tunneled underneath this manicured yard to get into the basement without disturbing the braided grass or the irrigation system. It only cost uh, the contractor about 10 grand. Or if you do it correctly, this is some of the stuff that we see. This is a this is about a three-year-old house, existing home. We uh, retrofitted with ground source, 3,600 square feet, average um, heating cooling about, about 30 bucks a month for three years. And I just got the report on this one from the homeowner. This is about 10 and a half years old, 6,200 square feet, average heating cooling $31 a month. And uh, I don't know how he's doing this. I've accused him of stealing power from his neighbor. And people will also ask, you know, how do you know how much he's paying for just heating and cooling? We install meters, uh, what are meters? on uh, the heating and cooling system independent of the rest of the power that the, the house uses. So we simply read the numbers and do the math. Okay, that's it. I'm going to wind it up and turn it back over to Bob. But thank everyone for attending. I hope you learned at least a little something today. Yeah, thanks. I learned a lot, so that was uh, good. I've got a couple. We've got a bunch of questions. Maybe Mark can read some of those off. Let me just do some of the housekeeping here, what's coming up next. Um, we got a, a panel radiator uh, webinar coming up, helping with coffee. We're going to have some people that uh, specialize in radiators going to do that for us. Um, one thing I'll remind everybody of too is like the um, uh, coffee excellence program. 
that we've got going on. And this is a chance to win a trip to Italy for you and a friend or a spouse or something like that. Um, that's going to run for a year. We just kicked it off last month. Um, all we're asking you to do is send some pictures and describe some of the job where you've used collective components. And uh, uh, we'll have the public judge those jobs. And uh, we're giving away some iPad minis also. And then, then we're going to be doing that for a year every quarter. So you get a chance to go over. You can pick the time when you want to go over. Of course, we'll go over with you and uh, wine and dine you and show you our factory and stuff like that. Um, as always, any topics that you want us to cover in uh, either hydronics or copy with copies, please let us know on that. Um, the next hydronics issue, number 13, is being printed. It should be out next week, I believe, on that. Um, and we've got some more exciting hydronics issues coming up for the uh, for next year for the springtime, usually in January. We'll have the next issue out. So uh, let's see, did I catch everything there, Mark? Any questions that we can get to while we got Danny online? Are you are you seeing my? Are you seeing the slide, Bob? It yeah. sort of disappeared on me. Okay. Yeah. No, one away for a while, but it's back. That's the. Uh, okay. That's what's upcoming. On okay. The, uh, the copy with Kalafi. Yeah, a couple of questions. One is on the ground loops, Danny. You may have answered it. I stepped up just for a second, but you talked about the criticalness of having turbulent flow. How would one verify that they're getting turbulent flow in each of their ground loops? Good question. Um, the software. Uh, has the Reynolds number, you just put in the parameters that you are assuming in the design, and it will give you the Reynolds number in every circuit based on equal flow through each of the parallel circuits. And the magic number is, uh, it will tell you the magic number is 2,500. And how do you confirm that you're actually attaining that flow rate? Well, on the Kalefi manifold, uh, it has the flow rate indicators that you can actually check. Now, if you bury the... Uh, had her in the pit, uh, that was my point. There's really no way to know what each one of those circuits uh, is accomplishing in flow rate. Now, you know, we can reasonably assume if you do reverse return, you know the total flow and, and you've done a, a fairly decent job of uh, equalized links, then we can reasonably assume the flow rate's going to be close. But you really don't know unless you have uh, a way to measure each circuit. Earlier you talked about um, the tri-unit type of heat pump. Mm -hmm. uh, a question came in concerning the load coax. Uh, should that be piped to a buffer tank, or can you connect it directly to the load? Um, I've always used the buffer tank because we've used that system you know, with a radiant floor. And so I've always used the buffer tank uh, just to improve the efficiency. And I don't know, maybe it's because I'm more familiar with it. And I think it... I would think the proper answer, if you ask Siggy, he'd probably say that he'd want to see the buffer tank as well. Okay. Uh, back to the ground loops. Um, do you have to worry about expansion of the fluid? Do you consider expanding oh, yeah. tanks? Yeah, yeah that, and that, that's a great point I didn't cover. There's so much to cover. Uh, Mark, let me go back and say I, I, don't, I don't think that uh, the manufacturers – will warrant the equipment without a buffer tank, now that I mentioned you mentioned that earlier question. Uh, but yeah, the uh, expansion of the fluid is always a concern. Uh, this, this pipe does expand and contract, and when it expands, it pushes the soil back and it contracts, then you may have a small air film, which is air film is R value, resistance to heat flow. Have I ever measured it? Have I ever dug a loop up and actually measured it with a micrometer? No, but it's just, I know it's just something I, I'm uneasy about. And so I always try to incorporate a method to, uh, to take care of that expansion. Okay. Here's interesting. Concerning the filling and purging, you showed that cart. Uh, could one rather instead take advantage of the loop circulator for filling and purging? There is. Uh, we've opened up another subject, and I didn't want to uh, take the time. To th there are pe people that are proponents for non-pressurized loops, uh, John Manning being one, and I can't argue with John. He's pretty sharp. But in that case, yes, you can use the uh, loop pump itself to purge the air. It's a non-pressurized loop. But uh, the only other option is for the pressurized loop for purging, uh, of course, now if you use air elimination, as in the you know your air separators, whether you use Kalefis, Aspire vents, or Tacos, or whatever, you would be using the ground circulator to eliminate air over the process of operating the system. But with the Kalefi manifold, we actually just purge the system using a water hose without the purge pump because we're able to isolate the, the actual circuits. And now, we just cranked it up yesterday, so 
we'll see how it works. But uh, uh, did that answer the question? Yep, it did. Okay. Uh, another one, on that, that you had a photograph of the um, system where you brought your loops into the building and terminated them on the uh, Kleppe, um manifold. But uh, was that a uh, backup boiler on the wall for that system? Yes, uh, it is, and um, probably never come on. But uh, it's there nonetheless in case we had a some type of failure. Uh, it's a um, triangle tube, prestige, I believe. And the load calculations actually did show a little bit of a deficit on the heating side. And so we just felt it was prudent uh, to stick it in there. But again, in those situations, we've got boilers hanging on walls like that that have never been energized. Okay. Um, there's quite a few more questions coming in here, but oh, okay. uh, I think we've probably got uh, time for maybe uh, another one. Um, as it relates to antifreeze, any pointers concerning the use of antifreeze? You say you try to stay away from antifreeze if you can. Any um, takeaways from your learning? Well, in my younger days, I, I actually did in, indulge in better living through chemistry, and the the product of choice is uh, propylene glycol. So um, most people don't uh, lose much sleep over using that as far as the environmental concerns. The, the product for years was methanol, and still still is methanol. You just have to be extremely careful with it because it's the same stuff that, that Bob uses in his dragster, and uh, highly flammable. You need to make sure it's diluted before you take it into the building. And just follow the uh, prescription on how much uh, freeze protection you need based on your design. It'll tell you. The software will tell you. You need to freeze protect the loop down to X temperature. And then you need to confirm that with the hydrometer to test it. And you need to back that up with a freeze stat on the unit. There's nothing really more sickening than to hear ice go through one of these uh, coaxes. So... Uh, that's the best device I could give you is uh, propylene glycol is more environmentally friendly choice, and then a lot of people still using methanol. The propylene glycol heat transfer, the uh, specific heat is a little worse than the methanol. Okay. Two more questions. One is, what is your perspective on high-efficiency mini-split heat pumps given geothermal systems a run for their money? Well, um, I think one of the one of the advantages of the ground source in my neck of the woods is the tax incentives, and when that goes away, um, I think they'll be more comparable on the on the sheet. But typically, when we do calculations for projects, we find with the tax credits that the ground source option is a lot of times cheaper than uh, whatever air to option the mini split heat pump or the conventional air to air. There are a lot of good applications for mini splits and we use them. Uh, we use them a lot with the little compact air handlers and uh, there's really nothing I can say bad about them. It is extremely finicky for being, uh, uh, being really proficient in the design. The air handlers don't have a lot of static. So I guess the, the summary is they're appropriate for certain applications. The, the great thing about geothermal that I found is we do mostly all energy star type homes and we need capacities lower than the one and a half ton that the conventional air to air people offer and we can get the ground source units down to 9,000 BTUs. So that somewhat gives the ground source option a little bit of an advantage compared, compared to the mini split which are typically inverter compressors. So I guess the right answer is it's uh, you know six one way and half a dozen the other depending on the, the application in my mind and the budget of course and the tax liability tax credits mean nothing for someone that doesn't have tax liability. Okay. And last one is given those fantastic energy bills that you showed examples of, what part of the country were those houses located? Uh, right here in the Piedmont, North Carolina, Winston-Salem, Greensboro uh, area. Um, so right here locally, 4,000 degree days, uh, winter design of 20, uh, summer design of 89 to 90. Great. Okay, Danny, I think some of the other questions are more job specific. We'll make sure we get to those um, in time uh, individually after the webinar. So I think that's all the questions. All right, thanks everybody for joining us today, and thanks, Dana. This was great. It's going to go down as a record breaker, I think, and um, we'll see you at the next show.